everyone. Thank you for coming out to you Rise Above. It's been three years in the making. Uh, we traveled all over the world, literally, to put this together to give a voice to public education. Uh, I've been told several times that it's one-sided, and you better believe it's one-sided because all we've heard is the other side of the story, and it's time that we uh, tell the public education side of the story. So I hope you enjoy this film. Thank you very much. Um, this is not about a political party, by the way. This is about the injection of politics in public education and what politics, um, how it hurts public education. We need a, a, an education agenda, not a political agenda in public education. Because uh, with politics involved, then the political party that's in power only uses public education as a, as a political football and our kids are stuck in the middle. And so we're gonna fight the good fight to make sure that people understand what the injection of politics is doing to our public schools. I would like to take uh, just a brief moment to introduce to you my uh, school board president to travel down with me. And I am very grateful to a school board that allows me to uh, do these kinds of opera, these kinds of things, and have these opportunities. Uh, Mr. Alan Carpick, president of the West Lafayette School Board. I like to thank Chrissy and ICPE for allowing us to be here. I'd like to thank Dr. Demuth for allowing us to be here. Dr. Demuth and I were colleagues up in Northwest Indiana for quite a number of years, and I'd like to thank Dr. Ed Eiler, who is a great colleague of mine from Tippecanoe County, for being here and. I want to thank all of you for being here. So as you watch this film, you may get mad, you may get upset, you may cry, you may be happy, you may cheer, you may want to ponder things, and all of those things are okay. What we hope that you will do afterwards is listen to the panel and listen to steps that you can take as individuals to help return trust and responsibility back where it belongs and that's into the hands of the professional educators teaching our children. Ladies and gentlemen, rise above the mark. Anything that you would like to add? I've decided to retire from education after 38 years of teaching because I still love what I do, and I, I loved it up to the end. Um, but I feel like the legislators have beaten us down, and I hope that some way we find a way to find our, fight our way back up to the top. education there is a bar and it's it's up here and never ever lower the bar bring the kids up to the bar it's your job every single day to come in and to be prepared and to be excited and to love your material and to love the kids 
and bring them up to that level. That's your job. I teach social studies in fifth grade, and the most important part of that is not memorizing the dates and the names and the places, or even the wars, but providing a shared sense of culture. That's what public education is about. If you can dream big and you can think of anything that you want to do, education, especially public education, where anything's possible, all of our children have that capacity to do that. has never been lower, never been lower in public schools. And that's a shame, it, it really is. So why am I still here? That's a good question. <laughs> that's an excellent question. I guess because I hope to make a difference. I hope to make a difference. School days, golden rule days. What is the golden rule? It's an ethic of reciprocity. Simply stated, treat others how you want them to treat you. Times have changed since Will Cobb and Gus Edwards wrote the song School Days in 1907. Journalist and historian Henry Adams said, a teacher affects eternity. But it's as if the slate has been wiped clean of the original intent of education. Reading and writing and arithmetic taught to the tune of a hickory stick. Today, it feels like the hickory stick is coming down on our teachers, the very ones who affect eternity. They've taken the education, the, the profession that I love, and turned me into a number. And on that number, I'm either green, red, or yellow. And um, the funny thing about it is I don't get to see that number. I don't get to see whether I'm green, yellow, or red. And um, I hate the perception of how most people look at teachers because we're all very, very hardworking, and we all love our children. Um, and they don't see that part. In Indiana, teachers' evaluations boil down to the colors of a traffic light. The state brands teachers with a color. Green, highly effective. Yellow, needs improvement. Or red, ineffective. Would we evaluate other professionals by the stoplight method? Indiana fifth grade teacher Diana Rathert retired early, even though she loves to teach. Governmental rules, tests, lack of money, and elimination of the arts all have taken a toll because teachers no longer have control. I think the other thing that's terribly demoralizing is the view of policymakers that teachers need to be incentivized either by money or by threats. Uh, they need to be offered a bonus because they're not working hard enough, uh, or they need to be threatened that they might be fired. And this is demoralizing. It's so non-professional. It's so demeaning to teachers to say, you're not working hard enough, so we're going to wave some money in front of your face, and you can all compete for the door prize. Legislators were once kindergarten students learning their ABCs. Each probably has a favorite teacher who inspired them through open discussions, experiments, field trips, poetry. Come to my classroom. Spend a day with me. Come and see these kids. Come and watch them learn. Come and watch them struggle. See how they're dressed. See what they eat. See what we do. 
I, we have twin granddaughters that live in California, the love of our lives. I would not encourage them to move to Indiana right now to be educated. That's how concerned I am about the restrictive legislation that has been placed on public education. It's not right, and it's not good for the future. Since the landing at Plymouth Rock, citizens, educators, and politicians have debated the best way America should fulfill its duty to educate children. Today, school choice, charters, vouchers, testing, and a one-size-fits-all model of public education are hot emotional issues. The goals are lofty. Provide equal access to quality education for all students, not just the privileged. Raise standards of quality. Spawn innovation and inspire students. But as promising as these objectives may appear on paper, each produces unintended consequences that tarnish the golden rule. So what can we do? First, before we can fix what is wrong and lift up what is right, we need to know what's really going on inside our schools while they cope with the new paradigms. If you were to follow me for a day, you would start off with me getting here before my contracted time, answering all the emails that I've gotten from the night before, um, teaching my students during the class time and walk, working with them, walking around as much as possible, using my entire prep hour to then document what I've done with them so that I can reflect. You would see me after school past my contracted hours. You would see me in the summer working on lesson plans and creating curriculum maps so that I'm sure I'm covering all the state standards. You would see me um, never sashaying in the hallway because there's no time to walk slowly. Uh, you shout hello to somebody in passing and, and that's all there's time for. Remember when you first learned to read? The wondrous enchantment you felt when you saw a word materialize from a string of letters? And when words marched along like soldiers in a perfect row, you could, for the first time, read a complete thought, a sentence, a revelation, magic. Mr. Dave Ruth was my sixth grade teacher, and um, Mr. Ruth was wonderful. Instead of talking about um, science out of a book and, and reading only about it, um, he would take us on a field trip and he would show us things. And our science test once was walking through Happy Hollow Woods and identifying things that he wanted us to identify to him. So we had a clipboard and paper and pencil and the magic of the woods <laughs> that caused the learning. Margaret Passaros and her family were war refugees from Cyprus. They fled to live in Chicago when she was three. Today, Margaret is an elementary school principal. When I started going to school, the school that I was in in Chicago, um, as a kindergartner and first grader and part of second grade, I didn't feel that it was an environment that I would consider safe now, looking back at it. We had um, playgrounds that had fences that were felt like sky high to a kindergartner at the time um, and it just felt like we were caged in a lot. It didn't feel like we had a safe environment and you know playgrounds often will have borders around them but this felt like a cage. It didn't feel like a border. Margaret's first few years of education in an undesirable school environment gave her a point of comparison for her future profession. I started um, going to Morton Elementary School in West Lafayette and had Mrs. Hazard as my teacher and um, Mrs. Hazard made me laugh, she made me enjoy reading, she made me um, just really get excited about school. But she would have this talent to change voices to get these characters out of these books and, and she would make that book come alive. Um, and that stood out with me because it was new, it was a new feeling that I'd never had before. That feeling was the thrill of learning. Today, Margaret is a principal in the same Indiana school system she attended as a child, one of many systems facing the pressure of standardized tests 
like the primary Indiana test called I-STEP. We are spending far too much time now doing things that are not those magical moments. And one of the benefits that I found in my sixth grade year with Mr. Ruth was that testing didn't have to be paper and pencil. It was out in the woods and it was, you know, identifying things that he had talked about. And it was, you know, why can't you integrate all those things that you've learned into a final on the run in the woods? So that's how it felt to me. It didn't have to be an I step in a book. Standardized testing is the new bully in school, pushing and prodding to make the grade, leaving no time or energy for classroom creativity. Inspiration cowers in the corner, a forgotten wallflower of public education. In Indiana, we have the most noxious feature now, this third grade reading requirement that if a student doesn't pass this I read three test, um, they will be held back. Um, ridiculous pressure to place on a child in third grade. It's just astonishing. When a child picks up a pencil to take a state exam, she determines the evaluation of her teacher, principal, and school. Pressure is placed on teachers and schools to become test prep factories. Most disconcerting is the unfair and unnecessary burden placed on the shoulders of a child. Uh, the problem we have with testing in this country today is that, number one, we're using the wrong kinds of tests, and number two, we're using the tests in the wrong kinds of ways. What the standardized test does over time is that it rewards conformity, it rewards people who can pick the right bubble, one out of four bubbles. It punishes divergent thinking, it punishes creativity, it punishes uh, originality. And if you think about what that's going to do to this country over the long haul, we are raising a generation of children who've been taught that there's only one right answer, there are no shades of gray, and that they must always pick the right answer or they'll be punished, their teacher might be fired, their school might be closed. This is absurd. Students answer questions designed by measurement experts, not their teacher. They lose more than a week of their education to take time for testing so their teacher can be ranked and sorted on a bell curve and assigned a number. And after all that effort and time, the teacher evaluation number merely replicates information the principal already knows. Our teachers are phenomenal and I think they really understand children and they, they know before a test is given how those students are going to perform. They can feel that based on their everyday um, moments. Every time they go and ask a, a question of a student or every time they ask them to respond to a question of theirs, they know how those students are performing. And the fact that testing has become such a huge piece of it um, is sending the wrong message to kids that they're successful if they can pass a test or get through a test. And that's not what's going to make them successful in life. And that's, that's the thing that worries me. Successful education systems use standardized tests sparingly. They understand that the money and time used for testing can be put to a more positive use, helping teachers and schools. Fruitful systems accentuate the positive, opening minds with the freedom to explore, to teach, and to learn. Finland's school system ranks as one of the world's best, with no high-stakes testing and lots of customization in the classroom. Standardized test was never invented to close schools to evaluate teachers. Standardized tests were developed for diagnostic purposes to determine how a student is doing. If you look at what the best systems in the world do, they use standardized tests, if any, for diagnostic purposes. In Finland, for example, we can use standardized assessments uh, so that we take a sample of students or sample of schools rather than employ these tests so that we test everybody all the time. If we want to hold schools accountable, there are a variety of ways to do that and we don't have to be paying testing companies $250 million to test whether or not our students know that have the information that we expect them to know. 
it has become so expensive to run in many countries, including here in the United States, to design high quality standardized tests, employ them, administrate them, and then use the data. That I simply believe that we should be using part of these resources for trying to improve teachers, improve teaching in schools, rather than measure again and again. Public education's measure of success should be the number of inspired minds that pour from the classroom, ready to do their part in their niche of the world. Inspiration moves in to make itself comfortable in a stress-free, imaginative learning environment. It's almost as though you have to have a complete makeover of your mental uh, approach to teaching to realize I can now do projects, I can now do activities, I can now look at each child as an individual and not a test score, and I don't have to worry about the bubble kids, I have to worry about every child reaching his or her full potential. Students should enjoy learning, we should be motivating them, we should be exciting them, we should um, be prompting their curiosity to learn, and instead now it's become a race to memorize. And I still keep looking for where is the leadership? Where's the political leadership? Where's the governor? Where are the senators who will stand up and say, you know what we've been doing is wrong. We've now had a dozen years of no child left behind. We have lots of children left behind. It didn't work. When I, when I teach lessons that are more creative or simple reading unit, let's read something. Come to the library and get a book that you like and read it and tell me what you think of it. They go, why? What? Is there a test on it? Is that, no, there is no test on it. We're just gonna read it and we're gonna like it. And they ask me for more direction. They want me to give them a very specific prompt to tell them what to do. And that's what they've been trained to do and they're doing it well. Um, and that's kind of sad. Well, school choice is expected. Thrown into the mix of education reform are charters and vouchers. Charters are public schools funded by taxpayers and promoted as open to all. But across the United States, charter schools aggressively screen student applicants. Funding for charter schools comes primarily from the states, so as more charters open, less money is left for traditional public schools. Uh, we thought the charters were going to reach out to the neediest kids, um, and we with vouchers, the promise was that they would save children from failing schools, but that was 20-something years ago. Uh, Milwaukee's had vouchers since 1990, which is well over 20 years ago. Um, Cleveland has had them since 95, and we now have at least 20 years of charters around the country, so we have evidence. We didn't have evidence 20 years ago. What we know today is that charters and vouchers do not get different results from public schools if they're serving the same children. Uh, so with all of these uh, advocacy groups, they're not even think tanks, they're advocacy groups pushing for charters and vouchers. What they're really pushing for is privatization. Uh, they can't make an argument that charters get better results because the ones that get better results are very few, and uh, many of those that get better results are skimming. They're taking the best kids, they're kicking out the low-performing kids, they're not taking a fair share of children with disabilities or children who don't uh, speak or read English. Unlike what our founders in the Constitution saw as a common system of schools, we will now have two systems of schools. One to serve all students, the public school system, and another private parochial school system funded by tax dollars where school officials will have the authority to pick and choose which students they allow. The public school in American history is an important democratic institution. It was never intended to be a market institution and the charter and voucher people uh, have no science, they have no evidence. Uh, all they can say is you need a choice, but it's, not, it's usually not a better choice. It's, sometimes it's a worse choice. Public schools do every bit as well as charter schools and the voucher schools. Vouchers are state-funded scholarships that pay for students to attend private school rather than public school. Vouchers put public education in direct competition with private education often reducing or reallocating funding from public to private schools. I had an interesting conversation right after the voucher bill um, was approved with um, the superintendent of the Catholic diocese in this area. And um, he was talking about how they were gearing up for voucher students. And I, and I asked him, I said, do you expect to be allowing voucher students um, among the 
Burmese and Somali refugees relocated to our city by Catholic Charities. And he very quickly said, no, they wouldn't be comfortable here. And I thought that was very interesting that they were so eager to accept voucher students, argue that they provide a better education than the public schools, but the refugee students, they can stay with the public schools and we don't have any interest in serving them. And I, I, I thought that was very telling um, and a little bit disturbing as well. The charter school community is extremely diverse. You know, you have some charter schools that are serving high need populations um, and in some cases, uh, well integrated populations of kids in very productive and innovative ways. Uh, but the charter school uh, reform is not a panacea, it's not magic, and there are a lot of charter schools that are performing much less well uh, than district-run public schools. In fact, the largest study of charter schools found that charter schools were about twice as likely to underperform public schools serving the same population as they were to outperform those schools. We will give our hearts to the children of Indiana to make Indiana the best education state in our country. Indiana's former superintendent of public instruction, Tony Bennett, was once the ballyhooed hero of the movement bent on reshaping public education through the use of charters, vouchers, standardized testing, and teacher evaluations. With his signature A to F school grading system, Bennett promised to hold so-called failing schools accountable. In the 2012 Indiana election, Bennett lost in an upset to award-winning teacher and underdog Glenda Ritz. Ritz was practically an unknown before she ran with the promise of an educational agenda, not a political agenda. So ladies and gentlemen, I dare say this is the last time I'll ever be on a stage like this, so I'm going to sign off by saying I have no regrets. In the summer of 2013, while Bennett was in his new position as Education Commissioner of Florida, it was discovered through publicly accessible emails that Bennett and his education team had made a manipulative move. When he was still Indiana's superintendent, it appeared that an Indianapolis charter school run by a prominent Republican donor would receive a poor grade. Bennett had touted that Crystal House Academy would perform as an A school, but troublesome high school data gave evidence that the charter school was not performing as Bennett had promised. In reality, Crystal House had earned a C. Frustrated, Bennett frantically put his team into action. The charter's grade deceivingly changed from a C to an A. Munster High School has been recognized by Newsweek, by the Washington Post, as one of the best high schools in the nation. We have received recognition from the College Board and from the Indiana Department of Ed for our Advanced Placement Program. This past year, our performance passing rate was 91.3% with the ECAs and, of course, assessments. A couple years ago, you gave us those goals. At that time, we didn't meet the goal of 90% ECAs. I went back to my staff, and we decided that that was a good goal to meet. And now I, now I have to go back to them and tell them that we met the goal that you set before us, but now you're going to be rated as a C. And so it came down to all the numbers say that your school is, is an A, except this one little criteria about graduation rate for special needs students, and we missed it by one student who then passed his ninth semester, which was his fifth year. But yet, because he can't do it in four years, it turns us from an A to a C school, one student. You don't want your high-performing schools being rated as a C. When now in a new voucher system, which you've created, we have a level of competition for schools now. So in an era of competition, which I support, in an era of accountability I support, make the accountability metric accurate and give us a fighting chance as a public school. On the one hand, the rules are the rules, and the the metrics were the metrics and everybody knew what the metrics were and you play the game based on the rules. You may not like the rules and then you want to change the rules for the future, that's fine, but the moment you're playing by the rules as they were set, 
and they're the same rules for everybody. When a rule hurts a public school, it's okay. But when it hurts a school that's part of this privatization move, movement, they need to change things. And it, it felt like we didn't matter. It felt like public schools didn't matter. Only 33% of Crystal House Academy's sophomore class passed algebra testing. So Tony Bennett and his team decided to favor the charter school by removing this principal factor. Our kids passed the algebra, algebra test at 94%. That was a goal that we wanted to reach, and, uh, and we did. We were definitely, we were much higher than 33%. While Crystal House Academy's 33% algebra score was completely dropped out of the equation to raise its overall grade only one year prior. Munster Public Schools were denied flexibility to eliminate one student's low performance rating that kept them from an A. Tony Bennett readily made exceptions for his favorite charter school, but not for a public school. You know, I wanted to go back and hug some of my teachers because they felt like they did something wrong. They felt like when we got to see that they were the responsibility, they felt responsible. And yet, um, you see this and you go, I, you just go, wow. I mean, that's the, the best word you could say is, wow. The founder of Crystal House has given millions to Republicans, including $130,000 directly to Bennett's campaign. I made the comment to my wife, well, I guess if I would have walked down with $100,000, we may have gotten our grade change from a C to an A. And that's how I felt. After his Indiana wrongdoings were made public, Bennett resigned as Florida Education Commissioner. This time, Tony Bennett was held accountable. I made a decision today in light of the malicious, unfounded reports out of Indiana that it's not fair to the children of Florida that I continue as commissioner and deal with the distractions. Many reformers see charters and vouchers as the answer to failing traditional schools. But there are problems with that conclusion. Some charters create the illusion of greater success by discouraging low-income students from enrolling. So as students migrate out of schools that are not doing well, those schools get worse. They get worse in part because they are more and more full of kids who are harder to harder to educate. And when that happens, teachers who have choices choose not to teach there, which makes them even worse. Which is why when you add up the whole picture, you see these schools getting better and those schools getting worse and you see no net change. Is that really what we want? You can be for choice, as I am by the way, because you think it, it's right for students and teachers and parents to have choices. But you have an awfully hard time being for choice because you believe it improves the performance of the schools, the system, or the students. There is no evidence for that. There is not only no evidence for that in the United States, there is no evidence for that anywhere in the world. I defy you to point to a top performing country that got that way by introducing choice systems. We have a very equitable system because we have insisted that every school has to be a good school. Every school and every district has to have good teachers in their school. Every school must have a good principal, but we still have school choice. The parents can still choose the school or influence in the school choice where they want to have their children go to. But the difference is that all the schools are public schools. So the parents' choice is between public school and another public school. What you're looking at are countries in which not only is the average level of performance going up, but the variation in performance among schools is going down. So it makes less and less difference which school you go to, you're still getting a first class education no matter where you go. Finland is the poster child for that. What we're doing with our choice systems in the United States is the opposite. We're making the difference between the better off and the less well off greater every day without changing the average performance. This is segregation. We're segregating our schools. Right. In my mind, that's a disaster. You know, from the numbers that uh, I, I've heard about in Indiana, it's clear that 
uh, somebody figured out how to defund public education. Uh, the, I mean, when, when you think about it, the vouchers, the charter schools, the public schools, they're all drawing from the same pot and the, the pot is shrinking. The best thing you could do is just to tell the public what's going on. People really don't understand and they think that when they hear charters and vouchers, oh, that's nice, there's choice. They don't realize every dollar going to those schools is coming out of your local public school. And the more successful your school, the more it gets punished. In Indiana, legislators have taken the control of education funding away from local school boards, particularly the general fund. The general fund is the chunk of cash that pays for instruction, maintenance, and operating schools. The general fund is the heartbeat fund. It pays for the most important elements of teaching our kids. Historically, Indiana schools have been funded with local property taxes. But recently, the legislature removed the heartbeat fund from local property taxes and shifted local control to statehouse control. This gave legislators the power to shift and thus cut money from this critical fund that pays for our teachers. What that means is it's difficult to track what is happening with the money that's the backbone which enables our schools to exist. David Hummels and Larry DeBoer, economists at Purdue University, led an analysis of Indiana school funding. Their findings show that despite the rhetoric of Indiana politicians, over the last 10 years, Education funding has been reduced dramatically, with the biggest cuts coming to our highest achieving schools. I want to go back to go back 15 years to 1998. In that year, the average uh, per pupil spending in the in the state was about $4,700 per kid. I think it's a little easier to think of that in terms of how much money does a single classroom get. Let's take a, an average classroom, 21, 22 kids. That's right around $100,000 for that classroom. Now, that probably seems like a lot of money, uh, but it pays for a teacher. Uh, it pays for any instructional aids, teacher's aids in the classroom. It pays for physical education and music and art and the cafeteria and the library and the school principal and the counselors and any maintenance. Basically, almost everything the school does is gonna come out of that $100,000 per classroom. So, 1998, $100,000. And over the next five years, up through 2002, 2003, the money edged up very slowly. And so by 2002, you were looking at about $107,000 per classroom, just slightly keeping ahead of inflation. At that point, 2002 is really the high watermark for education funding in the state of Indiana. And everything since then has been downhill. So probably the simplest way to think about it is, is if you just look at the dollar values put into the, to, uh, to the schools, it looks like the dollar values are slowly moving upwards. $50 this year, $100 next year, that sort of thing per child. But then you have to take into account that costs of running the schools are rising sharply over time. Inflation is eating away the value of those dollars. So inflation is this kind of termite that slowly eats away at the value of the dollars being spent. The energy needed to heat and light the buildings uh, is getting more expensive. Textbook costs are going through the roof. Health insurance premiums uh, more than doubled in that period, and they went from 20 to 30% of personnel costs. Okay, so energy, textbooks, health insurance costs, those are all inflationary costs that are out of control of the schools. There's nothing the school can do really to, to avoid incurring those costs. So what we have, once you take into account those, the, that, those rising costs, those termites eating away at the value of the dollars, our classroom that had $100,000 in 1998 and $107,000 in 2002 is down all the way to about $82,000. That's a, in a, 10 years, that's a cut of almost a quarter of the money available to the average classroom to educate those kids. In addition to that, you have over the last several years, a number of episodes in which there were sharp, unpredicted and uh, difficult to uh, accommodate cuts. So in the recession, we had a $300 million cut to the schools. 
and then again the year after that, and again the year after that. And so the, the, uh, the accumulated cuts there were nearly a billion dollars. But a simple way to think about the impact of those cuts is to ask how much of the state's total income is being devoted to these educational expenses. If we go back to 2002, the high watermark for funding, it was only 2.7% of state's total income in Indiana. Today, it's more like 2.2%. So this has been a conscious political decision to devote less and less of our state's resources to funding education. So how does a school adjust to those kinds of steady, every year cuts in the, in the, in the uh, resources available to teach? So what do you do? You cut the supply budget. You go from offering PE and music and art three days a week down to two days a week. You uh, decide, I can't afford to send my teachers to a conference to learn new instructional technology for math and science classrooms. Uh, maybe you used to have a teacher's aide in the classroom who could help with kids who were falling behind with reading and math. Well, you let go of the teacher's aide, so now there's no one to help with that remediation. You let class sizes grow just a little bit. Not, you don't double them in size. You add a few more kids to every classroom. And so every day, each kid gets just a little bit less time from their teacher. And you encourage experienced teachers to retire so that you can replace them with low-cost novice instructors. None of that's a disaster. None of that is anything you could point to and say, you know, my school's terrible now. It's just termites eating at the foundation of educational quality. And as we know, uh, termites can stay down there in the basement for year after year after year, and eventually the building collapses. I just want to call you. Stephen came to Margaret's school as a fourth grader with challenges. He was not completing his homework. Academic struggles led to behavioral issues. As his principal, Margaret wanted to be proactive, giving him attention before he had trouble rather than after. Margaret and Stephen met on a regular basis. Sometimes if he was heading to a location, I would ask him where he's going and walk with him and then just talk about how he's doing. And so I tried to check in with him as much as I could to be able to help him stay on track. She, she's given me advice, like uh, I should get my work done so I could like be football player, because if you don't get your grades up, you can't play football. One thing I will always remember about Mr. Curtis, my principal in elementary school at West Lafayette, was um, that he would spend a lot of time with me during lunch, and I would always be the last or second to last or close to that, um, finishing my lunch. And so Mr. Curtis would sit next to me and talk about the benefits of chewing your food well and your digestive system and turned it into a learning lesson for me, but also helped me feel good about the fact that I was taking a little longer finishing my lunch. And um, he would sit with me and just chat, and we would talk about life and things that were happening in my classroom that I appreciated. Today, Margaret tries to connect with as many students as she can in the hallways and at lunch. But the burden of paperwork and teacher evaluations has taken a toll on the amount of time she has to bond with students in the casual, everyday moments. Far too often, she's stuck behind her desk filling out forms. Margaret doesn't want to lose the moments in her day when she can help faltering students like she helped Stephen. I think he was heading down a very bad path. He was very angry. He seemed very um, discouraged. He didn't feel like he could do it himself. He, he could do it on his own, and we knew that, but he did not. I don't think he believed that. We had to help him get there. If you fall down, she can pick you back up. 
Like if you fall behind in your homework, she can help you. From where I'm sitting with my son, yeah, she put in a little extra work than normal from where I was raised at. I was raised in a very different school environment. Over and over, I would tell him I believe in you, and I know at the beginning he probably thought I was crazy because I don't think he believed that I did believe in him. And so that message had to be shared often, and I think he now knows he can do it, but he also knows that people believe in him and, and support him in getting there. When somebody believes you, that makes you feel better and feel more confident, and you can get it done more easily. Across the United States, there are principals, teachers, and students like Margaret and Stephen. For academic success, children need their teachers and principals working alongside their parents. Teachers and principals need time to offer students flexibility and adaptability. Children need time. It's frustrating because the kids need us and the needs don't go away just because paperwork comes on. So adding all that has been an extreme challenge and I fight it daily trying to do what I want to do compared to what I need to do. Well, speaking on her, I mean, I know it's probably other principals in the same position, but this one, it would be a shame for them to take her away. And there's a lot of other kids that really need her. You know, she, she pretty much saved Steven from where I'm sitting. That's why I came down here. But for them to take, take, take that part of her job away, it'll be a tragedy. And that's the honest God truth. The principal is not our CEO, but our mentor to galvanize our teachers, to inspire our children of every race, sex, economic background, disability, and ability. That's public education for all. Public education is not a business. It's a right and a freedom and an investment in America. As everyone knows, if you're the CEO of a company, you're not going to take defective materials or or less than quality materials at the entry point for your manufacturer. But in public education, we encourage every student, to, despite whatever issues they have, handicaps, whatever, whatever their status is, we welcome them and we try to help each and every one of those students. So it's not a one-size-fits-all um, product at the end. I mean, we're trying to help each student. It's not like we're manufacturing, we pour the knowledge in the, their heads and move them on to the next stage in the process. Well, I think that Indiana is one of the uh, leading states in the country where you've got a, a, a corporate approach to education, a business model, uh, and they want to turn everything over to um, private management, um, and they will talk the talk, and it all sounds very, uh, you know, they've got all the good rhetoric, but what they really want is return on investment. Uh, they want to see the data. They want to have the metrics. It's as though they don't have children. They, 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 nobody there seems to talk about education. They just talk about uh, a corporate model of management. And education shouldn't work that way and doesn't work that way. If you listen to the rhetoric regarding running businesses like a business, it's all about collaboration and empowerment and trust. And all of the rhetoric coming out of the business community regarding schools is about intimidation and rewards and penalties and accountability. It's completely antithetical to anything that we talk about in terms of good business practice. We're not stamping out widgets. We're training citizens. We're preparing scholars. That's what we do. And, and so I think it's a, a big, it, it's, a, it's a perception issue that that's the fix. And I'm not so sure. The corporate model doesn't work with all doctors. You know, the person comes in and uh, can't be cured, well, is that a reflection on the doctor? But yet, we want to put a corporate model on, I've got, seven, you know, I've got 120 or 150 or however many kids, and I'm supposed to f fit them into a little shoebox, and everybody's supposed to behave the same way, and I'm supposed to have the same successes, and I'm supposed to make the same amount of progress with, these, with every kid, even though every child is different. 
The National Center on Education and Economy reveals that the problem in public education is caused by the political system, not by the educators. The people who have the responsibility do not have the power, and the people who have the power are not being held responsible. We are holding people accountable for things over which they have very little control. This makes no sense to me. I would rather say to people in schools, you have much more control over the program. You have much more control over how the money is spent. You will have much more control over who teaches in your school and how you structure the staff. So it, this, is, this is not an argument that everything ought to be cent decentralized. I don't believe that for a minute. It is an argument to say that the responsibility and the authority ought to be aligned. We need to hold people accountable for the things that they have some authority over at every level of the system. When I started to teach in, in Finnish schools in the mid-1980s, we had a very centralized system of education. Uh, we had an inspection system. Um, we had a lot of control from the central agency. So what we started to do systematically, first of all, we decided that we have to trust our professionally trained teachers and principals more than we were doing earlier. These legislators, almost to a person with no background in education, believe that they know best about schools. And that needs to stop. I, that really does. We need to give educators some room to do what they know to do. And we haven't been doing that for a long time. There is much doublespeak in education today. Behind the entities bearing names that sound forthright are actually profit seekers. The feel-good titles are smoke screens for those looking to earn the almighty dollar. I don't think the public has a clue about what's going on because so much of what's happening is couched in this flowery language about reform and, and better schools and better this and, and children first and students first and you know me first. And it's all about uh, not the children, but about creating profit-making opportunities for entrepreneurs uh, and destroying public education so that the whole sector of public education can be broken open for exploitation uh, by entrepreneurs in Wall Street. They are using the names of groups, American Federation for Children, Stand for Children, um, Friedman Foundation for Educational Choice. I mean, choice is like one of those healthy forests, you know, <laughs> terms that people think it's a good thing, but look behind it, look at the money, and you see that these aren't people that really care about kids. Um, these are people with business interests, with a political ideology that is contrary to the role of public education. Finland trusts its teachers to do whatever it takes to turn young lives around. If one method fails, teachers consult with colleagues to try something else. They relish the challenge. There are no mandated standardized tests in Finland. There are no rankings, no comparisons, or competition between students, schools, or regions. Every school has the same national goals. A Finnish child can receive the same quality education no matter where he or she lives. Education in Finland is all about equity. Like Finland, several other countries have turned around their failing educational systems as well. One of the things that's very interesting, I've looked at countries that 40 years ago were low achieving and inequitable in their educational outcomes uh, that are now at the top of the international rankings on measures like PISA. You see some real commonalities, and you also hear people tell you over and over again, we came to the United States and got that idea. They, they will typically credit their best ideas to us, but we have not sustained the kinds of investments in public education that we had in the 60s and 70s uh, and even the 80s when they came and looked for what we were doing. Uh, and particularly in the last 10 years, we've moved backwards rather than forwards in implementing the kinds of reforms that these countries have used to propel them to the top of the rankings with high graduation rates, high college going rates, uh, and strong achievement. What are those things? 
Number one, take care of children. They don't have children in poverty because they have social welfare systems that ensure that kids are housed, have health care, have food security, and have strong early learning uh, and, early, and good child care opportunities. So kids come to school happy, healthy, well-fed, well-housed, and ready to learn. I think that what we need to have in this country is a vision of education uh, that is that the children who are poor need the same quality of education as the children who are affluent. And we, we've sort of given up on that. We, we, we're, we're right now accepting that poor kids should just stand in lines, take, uh, take lots of tests. If they get high scores on the test, that's all the education they need. We would not accept that for our own children. The great puzzle to me is why Indiana, in particular, continues to resist investing in early childhood education. Um, people of means recognize the value of it. Uh, you know, we, we hear stories about people trying from um, infancy to get their children into the right preschool so they'll be on the right track to eventually get into the right college. Legislators should understand that those are things they would choose for their own children. We must compensate and esteem those in charge of America's scholarly contributions to the world. Successful countries invest in their teachers, paying them well. Number two, they have invested in a very uniformly capable teaching force. Um, we have great teachers in the United States, but we have a very uneven system. Uh, they've invested in preparing teachers. In all the countries I mentioned, teachers go uh, to be prepared to teach for free, completely at government expense in most cases, or substantially so, uh, and often with a salary or a stipend while they get trained. Uh, they've raised the quality of preparation for teachers, often coming here and looking at our best programs and then implementing that there. They pay teachers typically at the rate that other professionals receive, um, often at the rate of an engineer or other you know, uh, well-prepared professional. I keep thinking that we have to stop doing all the wrong things before we can start doing the right things. If we could just recognize that the path we're on now is the wrong path, it's taking us in the wrong direction, then we could stop and think and say, um, let's figure out what the right direction is. The right direction is one that respects the professionals in the classroom, that gives them the freedom to make decisions, and that enables them to uh, make judgments not based on test scores, but make professional judgments based on what they know. Uh, and to work with their colleagues, not in competition with one another, uh, but as a team. Because that's the way schools work. They work as, uh, it's a collaboration amongst professionals. Public education must generate well-rounded citizens who, beginning at a young age, learn science and math and absorb great literary works and languages while painting, singing, acting, and running outside to the playground. There have been reforms all over the world, certainly in these high-achieving countries, to focus on innovation, science, technology, problem-solving, uh, multiple foreign languages, starting in elementary school. Um, they value art, music, uh, physical fitness, because they want well-rounded human beings, uh, and also that builds their cognitive capacity. When I look at the people who graduated high school with me, there are lawyers, there are doctors, um, there are people who have gone on to do amazing things, people who have gone on to music production, people who are touring the world with their music. And this is out of a small public school in Indiana. And the students here are the same. They, they have great potential to do those things, as long as I can give them that outlet. I, I need to be able to give them that ability to explore what they know. The dreamers of today are the doers of tomorrow. You want to talk about what a teacher can do? Start challenging kids to dream about doing things that are almost so far out. Get in, it, 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 going to the moon for me was almost to some degree like science fiction. Curiosity is the essence of human existence. And maybe that's, that's another ingredient into our educational process. Inspire kids focus them on dreams to do things that they thought weren't possible and stimulate their curiosity when you I tell you what you want you want you want a measure of education when kids start asking questions that means they're interested they're curious 
They want to know more, and when kids want to know more, they, they educate themselves effectively. Public education looks different from a distance. Looking back and connecting the dots, we see that public education helps to create lives that contribute to the cosmos. Parents are the launch pad. Teachers are the fuel to keep a child floating toward the moon, the dream. The way we educate our kids is the most important infrastructure investment that we make. It's more important than roads and bridges and airports and prisons and everything else we spend money on in this state. It's by far the most important thing we do for the future of our economy and you know, for the future of the people in the state, which is ultimately what the government is there to represent. If we're gonna move from a model that perfectly served an industrial society to one that now serves this knowledge-based cognitive age, if we're gonna change the schools, we're gonna change America. And the only way we're gonna do that is if we all come together and join in that process. Public education has a track record of incredible triumphs. Many changed our entire society. Public education fostered hard-wrought integration. Public education welcomes special needs children and educates those with language barriers. Public education needs to pat itself on the back and march proudly towards new victories. Public schools are not dead by any means, and we've just faced some new challenges, but we'll overcome. I think that there are many changes we need to make to improve our schools, but I think we have to go forward with the belief that our public education system is a very vital, essential part of our democracy, and that we have to protect public education, we have to respect teachers, and we have to recognize that public education has accomplished incredible things in this country. You can help public education accomplish even more walk into a school, step inside a classroom, sit down in the school library, ask a teacher what you can do, look a child in the face. You know, I, I had a great piece of advice from my father um, about uh, being involved. Um, a lot of people want to complain and uh, moan about the way things are. And the only people that have the opportunity or the right to do that are those that are that are moving, that are working, that are doing something. So if you don't like how something is being done, get involved, find an opportunity. Our schools are desperate for volunteers and people that want to help, and there's a lot to be done. There's more to be done now more than ever. I can't find another place that you can make more impact. I was trying to do the math this morning and I quit because it was too much. But I probably run through 200 different kids a year for 33 years. I'm touching internationally throughout the world and I don't know of any other jobs that you can probably have that wide of a aspect in changing the world. In education, public schools do work. They are not failing. As a public institution, they made us who we are today and if we unleash their full potential, if we get government out of the way, we believe without question that public education can take us well into tomorrow and make us the academic world leader once again. How do we get there? Well, let's have that discussion. For teachers like Diana Rathert, let's find a way to fight our way back up to the top. Let's believe in our teachers, because a teacher affects eternity. Let's provide a shared sense of culture. That's what public education is about. Let's ask our kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? Public education is the launch pad to send our children into an orbit of possibilities. Let's give Susan Kwiatkowski time to sashay in the hallway, to talk to students, network with teachers, enjoy breathing space for creative lesson planning. Teachers need the freedom to teach like Dave Ruth, where a science test is a walk in the woods to identify with the world. Principals like Margaret Pissarros need more time to chat with students during everyday moments. 
Time to help a student believe in himself. Time that helps a parent know his son will succeed. Let's put trust and fairness back into public education. Listen to the people who actually work in education. Let's make the United States of America a world-class education system. But that's just the beginning. And now we invite you to join us. Let's support public education with a renewed sense of purpose and a renewed spirit. Let's make our public schools the best that they can be. Let's all together rise above the mark. can see us every day and know what we do and stuff like that. Well, legislators, they don't even know us. They don't know what we look like. For those that are watching, I, I want them to be able to really see what's going on in public education. I want them to see what is happening to our public education system, which is so important to all of our way of life. And I hope that to those watching, they will listen carefully to what we're saying. And once they have researched and they've looked into what we're saying, I believe that they will get involved and help us to ensure that all of our children have the highest quality education possible so that they all can rise above the mark. So thanks everybody for um, joining us on this panel. I'm gonna quickly run down the line of our panelists just so you have a sense of who we've got in, uh, in front of us. Um, and we want this to be a real conversation so I hope you do take us up on um, putting your questions on note cards and there will be people coming around to collect those now but if something um, in the middle of this discussion kind of comes to you and you want to pass a card just hold it up and we'll find you uh, during the talk too, so that is fine. Um, so I'm gonna start to my far right. Um, we have Dr. Rocky Killian, the West Lafayette superintendent and this film's producer. Happy to have him. To his left, Dr. Ed Eiler, the Indiana Coalition for Public Education board member um, that's representing that group. So thank you for coming. <laughs> to his left, Dean Gerardo Gonzalez, the Indian University School of Education. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for being here. 
Um, Dr. Judy DeMuth is to his left, the MCCSC superintendent. But not least, Ms. Erica Peak, a fifth grade teacher at Summit Elementary here in MCCSC. So thanks for being here. So I'm going to start the panel with the same question for everybody. And um, there is a timekeeper in the front just because we want to get to as many questions as possible. But we do want to hear from all of you. So in a couple of minutes, if you'd be so kind, what were your reactions to this film? Just to give us your perspective as a um, professional in education, what were your reactions here? Rocky, would you start us off? And I'm particularly, I guess I'd twist this question for you to say, how did this film come about? I was hoping you'd twist it for me. Yeah. I'm a little biased about the film. <laughs> about three years ago, we started having a conversation in our school district that the voice that's missing in this rhetoric about public schools and whether or not we're failing are the educators. And so we wanted to give a voice to educators. We wanted to give a voice to, thank you, a voice to public education uh, so that we could educate the public. As you heard Dr. Ravid say, the public really doesn't have a clue of what's going on uh, behind the scenes with regards to uh, this whole, whole corporate reform movement that, that is aimed at dismantling public schools. So our hope is to educate community members, our hope is to engage them and to get them out to hold legislators responsible for the decisions that they're making with regards to public schools. Sure. I think it's a wonderful thing that the film brings to the attention of people that very wealthy, powerful people are driving a, an agenda. They don't necessarily have the exact same agenda, but they're at least complementary. And unless you are unaware, when Warren Buffett gave his 30-some billion dollars, along with Bill Gates' 30-some billion dollars, that's $60 billion, which they have put towards three initiatives, and one of those three initiatives is education. If you want to look at the agenda, if you go to the Gates Foundation and look at the things that they support, they should sound eerily familiar. They are Common Core, standardized tests, performance-based pay, evaluation, turnaround strategies, which include firing staff, closing schools, and charter schools. And this agenda has been embraced by very wealthy people and hedge fund managers, investment, large private investment banks, which because of, of the new market tax credits passed under President Clinton, allow these very, very wealthy people to make money through basically the facilities related to schools. This is not about children, it's about making money. And they are, when you look at very, very wealthy people, we're not talking about the 1%, we're really talking about the one-tenth of 1%. If you're not a billionaire, you can't play in the game. And because of the wealth that they have, the number of which I think it's best to not characterize them as anything other than propaganda groups that have been subsidized by these very wealthy people that basically are manipulating public opinion and they use their personal wealth then through Citizens United contributions to affect the election outcomes so that their agenda is furthered. And you see in Indiana that furtherance of the agenda is the American Legislative Exchange agenda, which has pretty well been implemented in large stock in this state. And I think this film does a good job of at least beginning to start the discussion and exposing those kinds of issues. Well, I, you know, I think the film um, is a powerful, uh, accurate, and much needed uh, message. Uh, I really applaud uh, Dr. Killian and his board and supporters for um, creating the film and, and using it to foster 
what I think is a critical conversation around uh, public education. Uh, my reactions to the film uh, beyond that is that it is a call to action, which I think is really uh, necessary in the kind of environment that we are in. Um, you heard throughout the film and embedded in the message how education is critical to a democratic society. And uh, we heard references to even the founders of this nation who believed that an educated citizenry was necessary to preserve democracy. But the other thing that is essential for a democracy is citizen involvement. If we are not involved and we are not willing to let our voices be heard, uh, there are always powerful self-interest out there that will take advantage of whatever opportunities are provided to advance their own agendas. And Indiana certainly um, has been, I think, an epicenter of that kind of uh, political um, a play on the fears um, of, of people. And we need to bring out the truth and get involved not only in sharing that truth, but making changes where changes are necessary. Again, I want to thank Dr. Killian and his staff because I think they've done a great job with the film. And it's uh, touring really all over the state, so we really appreciate all of your efforts. Um, but I came today to see the film again, hoping to, to figure out when Indiana got so bad at education, because that really bothered me. I was a business manager, and I was working on the, the budget, and I kept hearing how awful we wa were, and I kept thinking, gosh, my parents went here, my kids went here. All of my family's been in Indiana forever. When did we get so bad? And so in trying to reflect on that, um, I finally came to the conclusion it was when Mitch Daniels took over the general fund. That's when I decided <laughs> that. <laughs> because it's, it's kind of like home, you know? It, whoever has the purse strings is going to make the call, right? So when he did that, he certainly made the call. And so at that point in time, we were at his mercy and we were at the mercy of the uh, whatever was happening um, with him politically and um, through his economic feats. And um, it really was very maddening at that point in time, particularly being a business manager where we had no local control. And school boards actually lost their local power. So you can talk local control all you want, but they lost at that point in time their, their power. Uh, my fear is, you know, really for the future in, in looking at the film again, that this whole political reform of divide and conquer. And that's what this is all about in the state. It's all about dividing and conquer and, and weakening. And I see it really this year as we go into this legislative session where we will as superintendents be fighting each other for a piece of the formula called the complexity index. And right now the complexity index for urban schools is higher, so they get a little bit more money to educate children. And for those more affluent corporations is lower. <coughs> However, the affluent corporations are now saying, we want that same money. So I see that really dividing uh, school corporations in the state once again. And again, remember, we have really um, our state board of education with Linda Ritz. And then remember, the governor has another department of education. So we're paying really a whole different division to govern education outside the authority of Glenda Ritz. So um, thanks again for bringing the film to us. So um, as a poet in my own mind of great fame, but no other place, I was really struck by the metaphor of termites because I felt like that most strongly represents what's happening where there are all these little things going on and any one little thing in itself doesn't seem like a tragedy until, and I speak from personal experience on this, which I won't go into, when you see the termite surface, it is horrifying. Um, and I think that that's what I took the most from this, is that w if we don't have more awareness that the termites are there, when the house is crumbling, we're gonna wonder what we could have done. The other piece that really struck me personally from the documentary was how many educators in it said, if you just came to my classroom. And 
I hear my fellow teachers say that all the time. If so-and-so just came to my classroom, if that parent, that educator, that um, politician just came and spent a day, or better yet, I also hear them say, well, I'd like to see them do it. So <laughs> I think that piece speaks because education is personal to everyone. Whatever your personal experience is, is what you know, and you feel like you know school. I've said it multiple times that it's a really strange profession because it's the one profession everyone's seen for several days for a large part of their life, so they feel like they know it inside and out. You've been to the dentist maybe every year for a certain part of your life, but you don't go, well, I know what that dentist does. I get it. I could do it tomorrow. But for teaching, it's just different. And I think that's partly because you've had good teachers. They made it look easy. Um, so I think that piece spoke to me the most, where educators are saying, you want to see the challenges? Great. Please come in. We'd love to let you see. I have a follow-up question for everyone on the panel, but I just want to kind of pause here because one of the audience questions, or I guess requests, I'd like to honor now, kind of going off of what Erica um, gave us, could all of the teachers and school staff, past and present, just stand up in the audience here? Can we give them a big thank you and round of applause, please? Thank you very much um, for everything that you do. Okay, so a follow-up for the panel here. Um, and Dr. DeMuth kind of touched on where we're going next. We saw the film, you know, takes us to a certain place in history and then kind of ends with Tony Bennett going down in flames and all of that. So while it's fun to Tony bash um, for some of the people in the room perhaps, I'm curious about the future where do you see the concrete next steps? Where are we going? Dr. DeMuth talked about the complexity index, which was something new to me. Um, the two departments of education issue that we have happening here in Indiana. So could you speak about that? Where do you think we're going? And I'm also going to kind of twist this for you, Erica, as a teacher. Can you tell us what might be missing from this documentary as, your, um, as a teacher from your standpoint? So. And I'll open this up to whoever would like to go first, but I'd love to hear from all of you about the future. Um, I think we have to have a real conscientious effort to involve our legislators in understanding what we know about education. And, um, you know, when we're sitting there, this, this afternoon I ran home, put the news on at 5 o'clock, and of course, we're talking about the preschool pilot. Are you kidding me? We're, we're now going to collect data to see if that works. We all know it works, right? So, so why is it that Indiana, and I've, I've often said to groups, you know, I think if more of our legislators would have had to get up and teach every day and go to work and handle three and four children at home and make home and come back and then start the day again in the morning, get their children, the babysitters, and keep going, Maybe preschool would be, have become more of a priority 25 or 30 years ago, but we still don't have preschool. We still do not have full day kindergarten paid for. We have to get those programs in place for our children. And I think that we have to have a concerted effort with our legislators to make sure that they understand what our needs are, and we have to take the pressure off of our teachers. Our teachers, it's not right for our teachers every day to go into the classroom and feel the pressure. And I've seen the pressure the last few years. And it takes away from their ability to do the great things that they do in the classrooms. We are very fortunate in Bloomington, and I really want to congratulate and thank of our community for passing a referendum. We have wonderful programs for our children, but many communities in the state of Indiana do not have them. So I think we, again, need to approach the legislators and be honest with them, and we need a lot of people doing that to make sure they understand where we need to go. I'll, I'll jump in here for a minute. Um, you know, I think that the narrative is beginning to change. Um, the corporate reformers, as Diane Ravitch calls them, have really uh, gained the upper hand and created a narrative 
around school reform, that schools are broken, uh, that testing is the way out of um, uh, that uh, spiral uh, that is needed for accountability, that teachers need to be held accountable and uh, teachers are not well prepared, they're not, um, uh, they're not committed to their jobs and therefore we need to create choice and all of that. We, we've heard it all, you heard it in, in the film. And the reality is that if you look at tons of studies that have been done, including the, the annual PDK studies, parents themselves feel that their schools are doing pretty well. It's the other person's schools that don't do quite well. But think about the logic of that. If, if as a parent I feel my schools are doing well and you as a parent over there feel that your schools are doing well, everybody's schools are doing well, but it's the other person. What is it that leads to that perception? if it's not the social narrative that has been created. And, and so I think we need to now take advantage of what seems to be a pendulum swinging back against testing, for example. Uh, New York, you know, one of the leading states like Klein and others around these uh, ideas of uh, reform uh, have now began to argue against testing. Uh, we're seeing it in the Congress. Uh, we've seen it in our own in Florida, a teacher stood up and said, you know, I will not uh, actually implement this test required by the state. And that's happening all over the country. And we need to take advantage and, and, and single out those voices and call our attention to it and encourage more of those people who feel that schools are working well and that all these reform-minded initiatives are wrong-headed to, to speak out and support their, their efforts. I will, I will probably follow up a little bit. The uh, huge termite that is in the room has been, a, a, since the film was made, it's an ever-expanding scope of vouchers and a, an expansion of the charter school legislation to support privatization. Uh, along with that is the furthering the ALEC agenda, and we've seen that, whether it's in certification, virtual uh, charter schools, uh, the threat of state intervention, and I think we're now going to see this controversy playing out between the Common Core, but more than the Common Core, it's what the Dean was talking about, and that is the emphasis on testing, and particularly testing regarding really young children. I think you'll also see some action on the part of the state. They're not happy with the fact that they have an evaluation model, but the overwhelming majority of teachers in Indiana were rated as effective or highly effective, and they look at the number of schools that received either failing or D grades, and they think that that's incompatible with that kind of an evaluation system. So it will be interesting to see where that goes, but I think those are some of the things that have happened and that we can look forward to continued uh, intervention and in legislation. So what do I think is next? I think it really depends upon each of you. I think it depends on what we decide to do. Uh, I think we hold destiny in our hands to make the decision. And I've often said if legislators like grading us, it's time to grade legislators on their support or lack thereof of public schools and every voter should get a report card about their legislator and whether or not they support public schools. So for me, um, looking forward, one of my biggest concerns for the future as someone who um, of course, went out looking for a second job to supplement our income. Uh, I work with pre-service teachers through Indiana University, and I worry for them and, and who they're going to be and whether or not they're going to stay because you're going to see teachers driven out on two ends, on the end of veteran teachers who can do something else, want to do something else that um, at least makes them feel good in the mornings. Uh, and it's not that we don't feel good in the mornings, we just don't feel as good in the mornings as we used to. And so as those go out, who comes in? How do you encourage someone to come in for low pay, long hours, high accountability, high criticism, where you could very easily turn on your local news and find out what a terrible job you're doing on your way to work? It's very hard sell. And I don't think you're gonna get people who are either very interested in, Teaching is a work of academics, 
and a performance art and compassion, a performance heart, if you will. You're, by the way, I'm copywriting that. It's a nickel for each of you who use performance heart because I could use the money. Because um, <laughs> I actually have three jobs. But um, I would say that's my biggest concern in the future is what happens if we don't become aware, uh, who do we get to replace those of us who walk away? actually kind of run with um, the kind of supports for teachers. I know that there are a lot of teachers here in the audience, but I kind of want to now turn the attention to parents. And Dean Gonzalez, you kind of touched on what can uh, we do? You mentioned being uh, standing up against test pressures, um, if that's something that you believe in and that your children might be experiencing. What can parents do? And I guess, Erica, what could they do, um, maybe specifically if they were a parent in your classroom, besides vote or spend more time with their kids? What's a parent's role that would be helpful in this? Or maybe things that are already coming to mind. I can start. <laughs> um, first of all, if you're a parent of a student in my classroom, one thing you can do is buy me coffee. No, I'm just, no, you could. Um, but the second thing you could do is talk to people because what I find is that when I talk to my friends and family and even people who know me well and have even been to my classroom, when I talk about the legislative piece, they are completely shocked. The, the response I continually get is, that just can't be right. I think you've got that wrong, which I love. Yes, I'm the one with the answer key and I have it wrong. Um, I, I think if you can communicate with as many people as you can, agree or disagree with what was shown today or what's talked about today, having the conversation so people are at least aware that there's a conversation that needs to be had. Obviously, there are a lot of things, a lot of roles that parents can play. First of all, you know, they can get engaged with their kids and help them with their homework and support them and make sure that they feel good about themselves. They can volunteer in the classroom or on the policy arena that we're talking about here. There is no stronger voice than a parent voice. When we educators speak out about some of these issues, we're defending the status quo or we are in the pocket of the union or whatever the, the label is. When parents speak out, they speak out because they care about their children, they care about their communities. And so that voice is essential, not just for the everyday education of the children, but for the policy decisions that are being made that impact those children every day. And if I could just add, at a recent hearing for a charter school, we heard parents talking at the microphone and advocating for all children, for education for all children, and that's what public education is about. Thanks. I'm going to um, kind of segue into the testing issue. So this is for anyone. Do you believe that standardized tests are an appropriate way to judge our young people, teachers, even schools? Would anyone be willing to make the case for that? And if so, why? Um, could we hear from you about testing? Standardized tests, as you heard me say in the film, were never invented to close schools, evaluate teachers. Standardized tests should not be used for that. It's, uh, it, it wasn't made for that. It would be like me standing in the garage thinking I'm a car. Um, <laughs> I'm just telling you, the standardized <laughs> tests were never developed for that purpose. Standardized tests, if anything, should be used for diagnostic purposes only if used at all, and I've yet to meet a standardized child. I could just say, you know, the, some of the most flexible people that we have in a profession are teachers because on a dime, they have to change a plan. Um, you know, all of a sudden the fire alarm goes off. So they're very flexible in the planning that they do in their work with children. Um, and in that flexibility, uh, I'm always, I've always found great teachers wanting rigor. It, it's nev they've never been opposed to upping the ante, raising the bar, making sure that there, there was rigor in their classroom. That's never been a question. And they're very good at temperature checking. 
So, you know, if you put all that together, um, again, standardized tests can give us those checks, but to actually label schools and label children and label teachers, I don't think that is the right direction. You know, the, the, cardinal, excuse me, the cardinal rule of testing is that they should be used for the purposes intended. And as Dr. Killian has said, there, there is no intention in creating standardized tests to be used for teacher evaluations. And now, to evaluate preparation programs, teacher education programs, um, to see how well the teachers impact standardized tests, that's not the purpose of standardized tests. They, uh, standardized tests have a, have a role in education, but not, they're not being used as intended, and that's not helpful. I actually could make a uh, point for testing to evaluate teachers, but not how it's used. I think if you ask a teacher prior to giving the I-step, what do you think the results are going to be for little Bob or Sue or Fred, who I always use as examples, although I've never had a Bob, Sue, or Fred actually in my classroom. Um, and then I give you my prediction, and my prediction is spot on. Then that tells you what I'm doing as a teacher. But if my prediction is completely awry, then that tells you what I'm doing or not doing as a teacher. I've never received ISTEP results that surprised me, um, that worry me, yes, because I know how much those matter to the kids and to the parents and the schools and my bosses and my fellow teachers. But they've never been something that didn't just confirm what I already knew through a series of assessments, both formal and formal, that I'd already given in my classroom. And if you use it in, a, in that kind of sense to make sure that I'm doing the right kind of measurements, then I think that that would be fair, especially also coupled with looking at other achievements I have in terms of student behavior and student comfort and student self-esteem. Um, a follow-up question for Dr. DeMuth or perhaps other superintendents here. Um, what does MCCSC do to assure that teachers are valued and listened to in the process of all of these um, issues that you need to deal with? How are teachers involved in that? That's an excellent question. I think teachers all over the state, we've been um, one of the last uh, corporations that have changed over to a new collective bargaining agreement and or teacher evaluation. But um, one great aspect we've had in that is that we've had time to study teacher evaluation and we've had a very collaborative and collegial group working on that comprised of teachers and administrators. And I think that's probably in the last two years uh, really been an asset to working through that process. As you all know, in Indiana, teacher evaluation is talked about all over the state because a lot of school corporations have been in the new model for three and four years. Um, we've had the advantage of sitting back and, and having time to work on it, the disadvantage sometimes because we worry about every little piece of it. Um, but that was very collaborative and collegial, and um, we're heading into starting to use that system and we really believe in a professional learning community and tried to put it together so it, it's built on collaboration. So I think that was probably one of our greatest assets in the last couple of years. We make movies and let teachers talk. <laughs> <laughs> Just thought I'd bring that one up. Okay, here's a question open for all of you, perhaps, if you have um, thoughts on this. From an audience member, they say, while I'm determined to continue to fight for our students at the ground level, so probably in classroom, how can we even begin to fight the big money behind our failed reform efforts? How can that be tangible? Do you wanna take that, Dr. Eiler? Oh, sure. <laughs> Give me the easy question. Uh, all politics are local, and I was naive enough to think when I started this profession I didn't have to get involved with, with politics. But if you're really going to get at meaningful change, one, you have to support election reform. 
uh, particularly in this state, uh, if, if, and it doesn't make any difference which political party you're talking about because both political parties right now are being manipulated by the one-tenth of one percent. The second is, I think, then you have an agenda of things. One is you eliminate the uh, new market tax credits for the school construction. And if you were to do that, a lot of the support for particularly charter schools and privatization would probably die overnight because right now uh, it's an extremely attractive investment. The third is to close the loophole such that the private foundations cannot directly influence public policy, which they are doing right now. Next thing is to demand of your legislature some financial transparency and accountability of charter schools. If there's anything that might get the public's attention is the concentration of wealth and of relatively few people through the privatization effort in terms of who is making what from taxpayer dollars. Being superintendent of schools every once in a while, I was criticized about my salary or benefits. They pale by comparison. And I think uh, something else, you have to support the kinds of things that Linda Darling Hammond was talking about. You have to be for something. You want to be for preschool, healthcare, nutrition. And I think that needs to be a part of the agenda. And uh, I think uh, being a member of the Indiana Coalition of Public Education because we don't have a billionaire supporting us. We ask $25 for people so that we can pay a lobbyist to fight vouchers and privatization. That's our sole agenda. And I think right now, you may have read that $16 million were taken from public schools and given to vouchers to uh, basically private, mostly parochial schools. And so that's something that you can do. It doesn't cost you a lot, but I would encourage that in a, to attend some of our meetings. One of them is in New, Bal New Albany on October the 18th and Evansville on October the 25th. And uh, finally, hope that Winston Churchill was right when he said, you can always count on Americans to, their, to do the right thing after they've exhausted all the alternatives. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, charter schools have been lumped into because so many are corporately backed and uh, have large lobbies, et cetera. Um, one person from the audience, and this is directed at Dr. perhaps Dean Gonzalez um, or others. I didn't hear anything about the benefits of charter schools. Um, are there any benefits that are pertinent to this discussion? Well, Dean I mean, Gonzalez or others. Well, I mean, I think the film, um, I think it was Linda Darling Hammond in the film who, who just pointed out that um, you know, there are some high-performing charter schools and, and there are a lot that are not high-performing. And when you look at the, um, the data across the country, you find that there are more charter schools that are underperforming percent-wise, the, the, the traditional public schools, and are outperforming uh, those schools when they serve the same population of, of, um, of students. You know, if there's one thing that, that we have learned through our research and these debates is that regardless of the type of school a child attends, what's going to make the greatest difference is the quality and the effectiveness of the teacher and the, and the building level of principals and school leaders. That's, that's what makes a difference. And so whether it's a charter school or a traditional public school, uh, Quality teachers is, is the key to having uh, the kind of results that, that we want. And, you know, there's a lot of debate about whether charter schools are providing teachers with the kind of support and, and compensation that, uh, that they require and, and should be getting as, as professionals. And there's some charter schools that, that are not, and others that, uh, uh, are, are, that, that, that is just simply not um, investing in teachers and providing them with the kind of security they need to do their job. As a superintendent who actually started a charter school, I think that there's a, uh, there's a place for a charter school. Uh, what we object to is, is people who want to be privatization of them to make money from them. And I think the charter school that we started was something that the local community and local school board made the decision to do. It was not made by the state. It wasn't made by a private person to make money. It was to meet the need and to free people of regulation and give teachers creativity 
in terms of meeting the special needs of a special population. I think that's a very healthy, proper role for charter schools. I do not think it's a proper role for them to either create division within our country between the haves and the have-nots, or a few people to make a great deal of money. I have another question for Dean Gonzalez. If you could talk a little bit about um, the process of teacher education. Um, we've got some audience members asking about alternative certification programs, reciprocity, and other issues that we deal with. Um, for training our teachers, as well as using a state assessment to evaluate graduates and teacher education program, how that's all affected here at IU. Um, so I know you can talk uh, from the IU perspective, and if anybody wants to throw in their thoughts, that would be appreciated too. So we'll start sure. Well, you know, despite uh, my um, strong criticism of some of the rules that were proposed here in Indiana uh, on the uh, on the on the basis of increasing flexibility, I think that there are lots of different ways that a teacher could be licensed um, uh, and prepared in a way that, that, uh, that would be effective. The, the key is to hold whatever preparation program a teacher may pursue to the highest uh, standards and, and to incorporate the research, what we know about the content knowledge, uh, child development, uh, clinical experiences into, into, the, into the programs. Uh, you know, I've been a very strong critic of what was known as the REPA proposals because uh, it was really an, a, an effort to lower standards and the deprofessionalized teaching. And, um, you know, because of the broad support of, of the public in Indiana, some of the more draconian aspects of that proposal were taken out. But there's st there were still things in there that I think deprofessionalized teaching, and that's that's what I think hurts us in the long term. We prepare teachers to be professionals, and you heard about the professional role of teachers in the film, um, not about helping students just pass a test. That that should be a result of professional judgment in the classroom, and that's what every program, regardless of how it's structured and how it's delivered, should be doing. spend about five more minutes, so I'm hoping to squeeze a couple more questions in. But for those of you in the audience who didn't get your questions answered here, we do want to intentionally follow up with um, answering those in other platforms, so something online and we can share those and um, run those by panelists through email and get those questions if you don't feel like they were addressed here in the time that we allotted. Um, but I have a question now about uh, MCCSC, so Dr. DeMuth and Erica. Um, this audience member is talking about how they, they understand the late Wednesday morning start times are great for collaboration with teachers and that was something that was really emphasized in the film how um, it's so important to have time for that but at the same time uh, a significant portion that, uh, of that time has to be devoted to looking at data and going through those things so what is MCC um, SC doing to keep a balance between state demands, testing data um, needs and also the creative process of teaching. Can you talk a little bit about those challenges? Balance? I can't talk about MCCSC, but I can talk about my PLC strategies. Um, our particular PLC is we have that Wednesday morning meeting, but we talk at other times too. Um, so that's how we keep a balance. Occasionally the talk is in a hallway passing when you're both running for the restroom and trying to beat each other uh, because you only have that moment to go to the restroom and if you lose that moment it'll be five hours before you get another and while you're fighting for the restroom you'll say hey how is so and so doing in such and such and what did you do to get them that high because I noticed they're doing really well so we have those conversations not just on Wednesday morning we have them in many places, and uh, not just the restroom, I want to clarify, that's not the main meeting place. It's just one that came to mind because it's near and dear to my heart. And I would have to say the, uh, the PLCs that um, I've been fortunate enough to attend, um, after a few years of doing the work, 
um, they're run very efficiently. And so um, not only is there collaboration on each student and, and looking at data, but also um, the collegiality and the exchange of strategies that are critical in that time frame. And again, as Erica pointed out, um, that's a time that the community has allowed us to have for our teachers that, again, has a structure to it. But there is a lot of other time that you'll see teachers collaborating. And, you know, one thing that happens here in the corporation, I know it, com it happens everywhere because that's the nature of the great teachers we have. Um, there isn't a day that I go by the schools in the summer that there aren't teachers here in the buildings and they're working to prepare. And on weekends and Saturdays and Sundays and evenings, you see their cars and they're preparing. So I think, again, we have very dedicated professionals and we're very fortunate. So there is a lot of collaboration. talk a bit of, a little bit about a couple of areas first what are you doing to get to support political candidates you feel are doing good things how are you getting that out there talk a little bit uh, as well about your parents your PTO do they have a chance to become involved in that process and how you see this campaign or this film reaching more parents across the state Hopefully I can remember the three-part question. I never was very good at eye step. Um, <laughs> it's probably why we, we did the film. Uh, we, are, we are trying to get the message out that all of you, that are voters, have the power. And I truly believe in the concept of an educational agenda, not a political agenda. And I truly believe in the concept that every community that is concerned about their public schools, need, need, they need to stand up and push back. It's time for us to stand up and push back and take back our public schools. It needs to be a community decision. It doesn't need to be a legislative decision. And the way that we do that is that in our school district, we engage our legislators and we have those conversations. And I would encourage every community to do that. And I'm very serious. I think it's time that we start grading legislators and their support or lack thereof of public schools and every voter in the state of Indiana gets a report card about their legislator. Uh, if they're going to grade us, it's time to grade them and it's time to hold, hold them responsible. With regards to involving parents, we have a very strong uh, parent base in West Lafayette schools. They've been very supportive of not only this initiative but many initiatives because we have a foundation, we have a variety of parent councils uh, within our schools that work with us. Uh, when we were getting ready to lay off about 10% of our staff, they raised $217,000 over summer to save teaching positions. Uh, it was called SOS, Save Our Schools. We did it in 2009, to, uh, the, the, yeah, the, two, the summer of 2009. So uh, if you give a mission to your parents, I think they will rise up and, and they will uh, get involved. How can other parents get involved and see this? www.riseabovethemark.com. You can request a showing. We will come to you. We also have DVDs and Blu-rays in the back, and uh, we'd be happy to sell you a copy so that you can have a showing in your home and have a dialogue, have a discussion. And the DVDs, by the way, have two extra hours of footage by subject matter, charter schools, vouchers, uh, legislators. We did interview legislators, but they didn't make the, uh, the uh, take of the... Uh, final film, but we, we have that available. So if you're interested, see us in back, and we'd be happy to get you a copy. I have very few of them, but uh, we'd be happy to get rid of as many as we can. Thank you very much. We're going to wrap up this panel here, but the discussion is actually not over. In a minute, we're going to bring the lights up and use 10 to 15 minutes for a local conversa conversation to get started right now. If you are able to come move up we're bringing the mics down so that we can actually hear the ideas that you might have generated and um, start an action list for people who want to do more right now. Um, but thank you very much to our plant panel. Um, you did a great job, and we appreciated hearing from you. So a round of applause for them. Thanks. Um, and again, there's also a chance for you to put your ideas on the surveys if you've got to um, step out. But we hope that, again, you come forward and um, be a part of the next steps talk that we'll have right now. And I'm going to pass the mic off now to the ICPE folks to 
um, make that happen. Here's um, Kathy, she's the local yeah. chapter. Thank you for coming, and I want to thank Christy and Gina for putting this together and being the, the wind beneath our wings. <laughs>